It will bring a lot of controversy to things because I'm not going to back down from the biblical precedent and standards that we carry. Okay? Uh, you're not going to get a compromised message on anything. You're going to hear some stories and some things from the news uh, about things that are going on that we need to be aware of. Uh, but I'm not going to compromise what the book of Romans says. Paul is going to start next week by saying the wrath of God is revealed against. And he talks about what it's revealed against. And in our day and age, in our world, uh, you've got the chance every single day to offend people just by standing on what the Bible says. Just, just get used to it, get ready for it, and it's not going to get any better. If you read the book of Revelation, you'll find out that sexual morality will be a characteristic of the tribulation time period. Which is why we're seeing those things explode even now. Uh, someone asked me if I was watching the Olympics, and I said, no, I'm not going to watch the Olympics. We've got American athletes who uh, don't want to don't want to be proud of the flag and have to bow down to every idea or thought or thing that has nothing to do with athleticism at all. Just like we're seeing in, in, in major league sports and everything. You know, if you want to watch a sport, I want to see the sport. I don't want to see your political commentary, your thoughts, or everything else on it. Just do what you, you know, do. Run the race. Do, do the job you're supposed to do. But we live in a world right now where your opinions, your ideas, our thoughts on the Word of God are coming under attack in deeper, stronger, and more strategic fashion than we've ever seen it before. And these, first, these two verses we're going to look at are very important. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. That right there should say it all. But yet, 40% of people who went to church when COVID started have not come back. 85% of Americans say they're Christians. That's a hopeful statement. Nonetheless, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous one will live by faith. These are verses that many of you probably might, might even have memorized. Uh, if you do the Romans Road, this becomes uh, not necessarily part of the Romans Road for salvation, but becomes part of the aspect of who we are as Christians and what our faith should look like and be like in the watching world. You want to talk about that first verse? Ashamed means being reluctant to acknowledge. In other words, Peter, who three times said, I don't know who Jesus is. We saw you with him. I you got the wrong guy. If there's ever been a time in American history for Christians to kind of step behind something else and not be noted or looked at or this or that because of their faith, it's today. And that's why we see churches and pastors and preachers from online to in public who have taken the gospel and said, I'm just going to rip this page out. We don't need it. Don't need this. Don't need that. And they just throw it away. That's why we have preachers that are saying, you can live however you want. And let me tell you, folks, that's dangerous. That's bad theology. It's wrong and sinful. Paul's talking about a gospel that has changed his life. Paul ended up in prison because he wouldn't stop preaching this gospel. Wouldn't stop praying for people because of this gospel. Wouldn't shut up to the point they took him outside of Lystra and they stoned him. And the only way they stopped stoning you was when they saw a great matter coming from your skull. And yet Paul gets up, moves the rocks, wipes himself off, and walks right back into town. Either he was absolutely insane, or he was so committed to the gospel he preached, that even when they tried to kill him, he said, I will preach it again if I have to, and if I get the chance. That was Paul. So being ashamed means being reluctant to acknowledge. And this is not the time when people need to be ashamed of the gospel. Because it's going to be the only hope that people have in the days, months, and years to come in that regards. As I said, Peter denied Christ three times. Someone who walked with him, talked with him. And when Jesus really needed him the most, where was Peter? Trying to find out what was happening. Kind of being nosy about that. But yet when it came down to it, he said, I, I don't know who he was. No. And Jesus had already told him before the rooster crows three times, you will, you will, before, the, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And what happened to the rooster crows? What was it say Peter did? He wept. 
He stopped because he realized he had just sold out the best friend he ever had in the last three and a half years. The, the friend he saw transfigured before him. Peter, James, and John saw that. Sometimes Jesus only took Peter, James, and John to see certain things or know certain things. He denied that Jesus three times. Not ashamed of the gospel. So literally, Paul had no sense of reserve about his mission or his call. They tried to stone him, he kept preaching. They tried to get him out of cities, he'd go somewhere else and build a church. No matter where he was or what he was doing, the gospel was the paramount thing he had to get out, talk about, preach about, declare, and establish wherever he went. I can't imagine what Timothy and Titus must have felt like if they really understood the nature of the fact that Paul the Apostle was personally discipling them and, and helping them learn how to pastor and deal with situations wherever they might be and the difficulties of ministry. Can you imagine having Paul as your mentor? I look back on the men and, and women of God and the sons of God who have poured into my life. Older pastors like Mary and Cazelle who took a church that was dying with four people when he was 80 years old and got that church up to 200 in a matter of years. Wow. 80 years old. He didn't have all the new stuff, the new ideas. He just preached Jesus. People started getting healed. Miracles started happening. I happened to be a pallbearer at his funeral. And I kept praying, Lord, let his man fall on me. He was a man of God who loved the Lord and told me stories about persecution. They, he pastored a church in the 1940s and a bunch of people came and let pigs loose in the church one Saturday night and shut the doors. So what did you do? He said, we still had church. What did you do with the pigs? We had, we had church with the pigs in there. And since they came to the church, we sold them, we slaughtered them, we ate them. Men like that that just poor and said, God, no matter what happens, I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to go on and do. See, he, 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 that was his heart. It would take him before kings and Caesar, centurions and peasants, slaves and free, and he never compromised the message of the cross. He never stopped putting the cross down. He never compromised it. He never said, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't talk about that here in Rome. You've got all these idols, and I won't say anything about idolatry. No, he said, I see one you've got to the unknown God. Let me tell you who he is. I know him. Everywhere Paul went, there was a revival or a riot. Read the book of Acts, and you'll see. Read his own writings, and you'll see. Why? Because he knew, God, you called me. You have called me to do some incredible things with my life. That's what Paul was saying. God calls you to do some incredible things with your life. Folks, I'm telling you what. If things continue the way they are in America, there may very well, there's coming a day, soon and very soon, where we're going to have to really live by our faith. And we're going to find out what it means to trust God for the next meal. When I was at Bible College, when our missionaries came by and we came through the, the Midland and Springfield, Missouri, headquarters in Simmons, I got to hear some of the, 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 the best leaders, teachers, preachers, missionaries, and pastors. That were out there, that would come through the, 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 the general camp, that would come through the, the headquarter city, and that would come up to our chapel and speak. And, and there were missionaries who told stories about how they would sit orphans down in the, in their, in, at their place, and they would just sit them down at a table, and they would have to wait for the miracle. And pretty soon there'd be a knock on the door. Some guys say, Man, I just jackknifed a truck down here. We got a lot of, 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 of uh, refrigerated food. And it's going to go bad because I'm six hours from home. And can you folks use some food? Just come get it. Stories that God provided and things like that. Times when a bread truck was going by and had a flat tire. Can't do anything. Hey, they want some bread? Sure, and they take it. I'm not just talking missionaries around the world. I'm talking folks in Arkansas and Missouri. Yeah. Tennessee and Kentucky where God just showed up. See, Paul lived that. Paul said, I learned how to be content when I've got a lot and when I've got nothing. He was shipwrecked, beat with rods, stoned, led down by, by the side of a wall in a bucket so he could escape being killed. The Pharisees hated his guts, they wanted him dead. The Sadducees hated his guts, they wanted him dead. The Essenes, the leader, the high priest hated him too. And yet, he never stopped. Preaching the gospel. 
And if they had not put Paul in prison, you would not have 40% of the New Testament. He wrote most of it while he was in prison. See, nothing set, no, nothing set him back. Nothing made him afraid of compromise. He said, Paul said, in, we carry this treasure in earthen vessels. And that, that verse, that verse means a lot to me. I learned, I, I learned about that verse when I was about 15, had just been saved, was reading through the Bible, and it became one of my heartfelt, uh, memorized uh, verses in my head. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. And the earthen vessels word used there is from the Greek, from one of the most fragile, fragile seashells you can have, like a sand dollar or a sand dollar, something like that. And, uh, and, God, and so Paul says, look, I've got the most incredible gift that I can share with the universe. And it's inside this frail human body that ages, that eggs, dies, bleeds, and, you know, gets, it, it's weak, everything else. And so we have this treasure with the best. And Paul recognized he had the most important message to declare and to preach to God to the world. And he had to do it. He had to get it out. And he also knew the cost of the mission would bring him his life. In, in the book of Acts, chapter 26, I want to read a passage here. Paul is before a leader. In Acts 26, verses 14 through 19, he's sharing his story with the king. And he says, And when we had all fallen to the ground, in Acts chapter 9, that story, Jesus appeared, I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Is it, hard, it is hard for you to kick against the goats. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord Jesus said, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. But arise and stand on your feet for the purpose I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things which I, in which I will appear to you. Paul spent the next three years in the wilderness. He says this in Galatians chapter 1. And for three years he had a discipleship experience with Jesus. Delivering you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles... And from the Gentile to whom I am sending you. Let me give you a picture. That would be like Jesus appearing in Congress right now to one party and saying, you're going to become like the other party. And you're going to go all in. You can decide which side you want to be on, okay? But nonetheless... That's what he said. I'm removing you from the Jewish people and from, and from delivering you from the Jews and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you to open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God in order that they may receive forgiveness of sins and as an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. In other words, he says, Paul, I'm going to send you, I'm going to change your name, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. You're going to, you're going to preach salvation to them. And look what he says next. Consequently, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to that heavenly vision. In other words, Paul says, God told me to go. I went. I never looked back. I never turned around. I just simply went. And the one who knew the most about Judaism and that culture, outside of Gamaliel at that time, and Paul probably would have been the guy that was grooming for Gamaliel's position. That guy left all of his Jewish background. As a matter of fact, in Philippians, he talks about how he laid everything aside like trophies. He threw his trophy, his trophy, being from the tribe of Benjamin, threw it away. Circumcised the eighth day, he threw that trophy away. Pharisee of Pharisee, he picked up that big trophy and threw it in the trash can. He said, all those things are done to me. It was worthless as manure. Because God's called me to preach and to teach and to take the gospel and do something different with it. He continues like this. The gospel he preached had power behind it. Dynamis. Dunamis. The word we get dynamite from. And here's the other thing about it. It wasn't on the impact of blowing other religions away. Here's what it was. The emphasis in Paul's gospel was on the efficacy of the gospel. How efficient it is. How good it is. For healing, salvation, stability. And the fact is what helps us become righteous. You cannot become righteous, holy, true, or perfect without the gospel. You can't do it. It won't work. It's the only way that trains you, teaches you, leads you, guides you to those places that you need to be. Our salvation means redemption, but it also means restoration and reconciliation. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and to the Greek. He's making the point here. God's special people, they were God's special people. There's no doubt about that. 
But it also means <laughs> they couldn't just get by with anything. Romans 2 9 says, There'll be tribulation and distress for every soul of mankind who does evil. For who first? For the Jew first and for the Greek. Now people say, Well, why did, why did God just do that for the Jews? That was all, that was all good for them. Uh, uh, did you just read this verse? He says, if you're the first to know, you're the first one responsible for that truth and what you do with it. Right? You ever get on a plane and you sit near the exit and they say to you, are you going to do what we need to do? Should this plane go down and land in the water and you've got to open the door? Or are you going to do that? I've seen people a lot say, uh, no, I'll, I'll sit somewhere else. Anybody seen those sort of things on planes, you know? If you're going to sit in that spot, you've got to be responsible to do what you're supposed to do. Because everybody else in that plane will be dependent on you. The Jews don't realize, the Jewish people don't realize they are still responsible for the gospel. What they do with it and what they don't do with it in that regards. And the historical priority is this. The Jew who hears the gospel first is also judged first for their sins. Are you sure about that? Read uh, Romans 2.9. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of mankind who does evil. There it is. Black and white, plain English. Or actually plain Greek. But it's been translated for us. They had the first chance to accept Christ. And now we as Gentiles do as well. In other words, it's fair, folks. We've been grafted in when we accept Christ. We have to also understand that we have some Jewish roots. We have to recognize, understand, and take, and, and take into perspective. We look at verse 17 now. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. I don't know where the F on from keeps going. But I'm going to find out. As it's written, but the righteous one will live by faith. Faith discloses something that, that cannot just be accepted and demonstrated. You can't say, God made me righteous. Without getting saved. You see, because when you get saved, your heart changes and shifts a little bit. You realize, oh man, I can't be talking like that. I can't be living like that. I can't be saying those. I can't be telling those jokes. I can't think those thoughts. And so, as we begin to take up our cross and follow Him and deny ourselves, God begins through the gospel to make us righteous. Because faith helps us get to know who Jesus is. Anybody here ever had to live by faith in situations? I know some of you. You've been in some dark places, some dark spots, some hard times. And it wasn't easy. You said, Lord, I need you to help me through. I can't see what's going on. I don't trust you to get me out of here. And the gospel doesn't change us. It just merely reveals God's character. Then it's no gospel worth pursuing. In other words, if the gospel I preach does not change your lives, impact your hearts, bring transformation in your life, it's not the gospel Paul was preaching All the people said, oh, you don't have to live by the laws of the Lord. You don't have to follow the book. Just say a prayer and you're good for the rest of your life. That's a false gospel. A prayer you say when 10, when you're 10, will not cover sins you commit at 30 or 50 or 75. And that, that is one of the flaws of, of that thinking and that theology that, well, I said, and I've taught people here locally. Well, I said a prayer when I was 15, and now I'm good. Or, well, I go to this church, and my grandma and my mom and dad went to church there, so I'm good. Good's not good enough, folks. Christ requires transformation, absolute salvation, a turning away from our sins and walking towards Him. Righteousness is also revelatory. It reminds us of what needs to change and be sifted in our lives. When you read the Word and you see something about changing something, God's going to continue to hammer on your heart. You know what I like about conviction? I like conviction when it doesn't leave. I understand what I'm about to say. Because once conviction is left, and you're like, does that bother you anymore, God? Yes, it's good. And don't we have that attitude sometimes? Oh, I used to be convicted about that, but no longer anymore, am I? You might be in trouble, more trouble than you know. Conviction is a good thing. Conviction is an absolute necessary thing for the believer. And when the Holy Spirit's not saying, hey, think about what you just said. Uh, should you really be watching this? Hey, that wasn't a good response between you and your family member. Or whatever. That's good for us, folks. Because the Holy Spirit is trying to say, hey, 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 let's get back to this. 
Let's get back to living like the Lord, the Lord tells us to live and make sure we're different in that regard. Righteousness will shape us, it will mold us, it will bring transformation in that sense. And the more we walk by Christ, the more we do our best to live for Him, the more righteous we become. And others will begin to look at us and realize that we are different, we are changed, that we're not the same people that we were. You know, sometimes when you get, when you get, to, when you get to school and you're going through school, if you had, I had two older sisters and I had a younger brother. And by the time I got through middle school and got to high school, I remember a principal saying, I heard about you. My freshman year, I made, made some decisions, did some stupid stuff. I was a great student, straight A's, and, and, and did good at school. But I just had this ornery streak and this mean streak. But I remember first day, I mean, he's out there watching kids get off the bus and come into school, and he's like, I'm hurting you, Mr. Coverstone. And uh, just so you know, you got down like this, he said, It wasn't a challenge, it was, I've heard about you from the middle school people. I've heard about some antics and things you've done, and I'm going to make sure you don't do them here. I'm glad that there are people that are watching us, folks. I'm not talking about your TV or smartphone. I'm glad that people can look at you and look at me out in public. I was walking across, one February I was walking across the campus of CBC, and I was, just, I, was, I was just flying to get to work, it was early in the morning, it had snowed, it was ice, and I come around the, I come around the security guard shack, and my foot went out from under me, and I landed on my back, and my first thought was, oh, nobody saw. <coughs> Made breakfast at the cafeteria, was serving that up, security guard comes by, and leans in, and he goes, it's all bad. <laughs> you know, I'm glad there are people that are watching that can say, hey, I saw your response. Was that, was that Christ-like? No. Because you keep looking at this. The righteous should live by faith. That's a promise and an endorsement. And when you live by faith, Mike, it's obvious that you're living by faith. It's obvious to see that. I thank you for that testimony. I thank you for that life. Not that no one else in here is. But in your condition, your situation, I see smile on your face. Hey, I'm going to live as long as I can. Let the Lord have my life. I appreciate that. In other words, the righteous shall live by faith. Even we don't know what tomorrow holds or what's coming or how difficult this thing may be or that thing may be. We understand that. And it takes faith to carry your cross, to stand for His word, to put on the armor, to declare the truth in a world that is hostile towards what we believe. So starting next week, I promise you, my emails, the church emails, and stuff that we get on, on our live stream will pick up. We start talking about the three things that God gave humanity over to for the next three Sundays. And I can promise you, there'll be some people watching that cannot accept that what I say that is biblical. It should not be in any church in this, on this planet. People get upset about it. But you know what? I'm still going to say it. I'm still going to speak it. Last I heard, we still have a First Amendment. But nonetheless. And that won't mean that you won't struggle or hurt or worry. This idea that once you're saved, life becomes a bowl of cherries. And it's full of cream and foam. And sugar falls out of heaven on your tongue every time you're hungry. And you'll never have a flat tire and never run out of gas. And you'll never have a bill or a debt. You know, look. I don't know who dreamed that up. They have no idea the nightmares they put some Christians through. Because Jesus said, through many trials and tribulations, you will enter the kingdom of heaven. So guess what? The whole idea that everything about your faith is going to be easy, cheesy, peasy, whatever it is. That's a lie from hell. That's a lie from hell. And the churches that are not prepared and passionate, that are not prepared in their people for the hard things that are going to come and the hard situations their faith will lead them into are going to pay a great price for that. Yeah. They're going to pay a great price for that. I will stand before God one day and I will have to give an account for what I preached and what I taught and what I didn't talk about and what I did talk about and what I warned about and what I didn't. And the wolves are out there right now and they're in the churches and they're, 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 they're bashing up against Christians in the workplace and education and everything else. And i got to do my best to warn you and say, hey, you're going to need your faith more than ever in the months to come. Because you're going to find out how strong your faith really is. 
We're about to find out really how strong some of these people who, who claim to have it all together really are. You ever see somebody for the first time, like without makeup? I'm not talking like wives or something like that. You ever seen somebody that you thought was shit, like, okay, Hollywood celebrities? Hey, we got this, this great picture of this person you've never seen without makeup. Ah, holy cow, how in the world did that happen? Folks, give me some people who, who you thought, oh man, they've got it all together, and guess what? No foundation. We're about to find out in the church of America who built on sand, who built on the rock. And you're going to see it. It's going to be neighbors, family members, and friends in all those sorts of situations. So we've got to stand up and stand out and let our faith shine to the watching world. We have got to be faithful. We've got to be the witness that God's called us to be. We've got to be prepared. Uh, and that's why this prayer event at the end of this month, August 28th, from, nine, from 10 to 4. Six hours of prayer focusing on the, asking the Lord to strengthen the church for the things that are coming. I don't know why I feel the emphasis, but that's the emphasis I've had for just the last several months. And the week after that, I'm going to be in Dallas, Texas for the, the September Psalm Assembly event that Stan Johnson's having. And I'm thankful that he, he caught wind of what happened last year when had the prayer event. Had about 500 people in a room. Started that thing with shofars blowing. Started in the end of the thing with shofars blowing. And what was very interesting to me was that I heard people for two solid days and Richard, Richard was there. Richard can confirm this too. There were people who came to a microphone for 48 hours and prayed out loud. There was a lady who was there and she said, I've never prayed out loud in public before. And her first step in the microphone was like this. Lord, I've never done this before. I prayed out loud. Last week, her prayer was like, God in heaven, you get a hold of this nation. You shake it. Whoa, what happened? Because she got around people who knew how to pray. And I'm telling you, church, We've got to pray. We've got to pray earnestly. We've got to pray aggressively. We've got to pray specifically. We've got to pray strategically. Things are going to happen. Things are going to shift in the next several months. Yeah. Many of you sense that. Many of you hear that. Many of you feel that. I'm hearing from people who are intercessors around the nation. Yeah. You know, each, each coast, there are people who are being called to wake up in the middle of the night and pray. Just pray and pray and pray. And once again, we're not going to be praying for the nation that August 28th event. We're going to be praying for the church to have backbone and be able to stand strong. I want you to come be willing to pray for those that are kind of weary in their faith. Those that are kind of ungrounded in their faith. We're going to be praying that the people wake up and get shaken and, and, and are ready in a place to stand up and do what we need to do in the eyes of what's coming against us. That's what it's all about. And right now, faith is going to be, is going to be needed more than ever. More than ever. I do not know exactly what's coming. But I know I've talked to hundreds and hundreds and probably even a thousand people in just the last six months, all of which say we feel such a such a burden for the next couple of months that something is going to happen. Something is going to snap. David, David did a wedding this last weekend in, in Georgia, and, and he saw some pastor down there who said the very same thing. We don't know what's coming, but something big is coming. Something big is coming to America. Something big is coming to church. Something big is going to involve the whole nation. And when that many people are saying, hey, this is going on, this is going to happen, guess what? We better wake up, we better pay attention, we better listen, and we better respond. Some of you say, well, I've never prayed for six hours. We'll teach you. It's not going to be six hours of on our knees praying. We're going to have some praise and we're going to have some teaching, some training time. We're going to be praying for different people. We're going to be asking the Lord to baptize in the Holy Spirit. We're going to be asking the Lord to, 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 to impart some of the, 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 the gifts of the Spirit to people. And one of the things being so far from people from several states are going to be here. People who drive here from Pueblo, Colorado, and park an RV out on our RV hookups. All because they want to come and pray. Now tell me. Tell me. Where are we seeing that kind of move among the nation? We've got to have it here as well. And that's why I'm acting and challenging and encouraging you folks. Look, Sunday morning after we have this prayer event, we're going to start a Sunday morning through Wednesday night revival, all in-house people. We're going to talk about building your life on the Word, taking your standing on the Word, standing in the Spirit. I want to trust the Lord that even before then we're going to see people baptized in the Spirit like we've never seen before. Because you're going to need that, folks. You're going to need that in the days that are coming. 
If your time in the Word has not been strong, start working at it. Start working out with it. Get your prayer life in order. Surround yourself with people that you can pray with as well. Be accountable. Okay? Because I'm, I'm going to go back just... I'm going to go back to the very, the very first slide. The very, this one. Well, not that one. This one. That's your mission today, folks. That's your mission. To not be ashamed of the gospel. To walk in the fullness of the power of it out there in that watching world. And to live by faith. To live by faith. And there are some changes and challenges that are coming, folks. They're going to make it very, very real to all of us in the weeks and months to come. I really believe that. I really believe that. I believe that in the Spirit. I'm hearing that from other pastors. I'm hearing that from missionaries. I'm hearing that from people who do the pray with me in the mornings and those who follow the podcast. I'm hearing from around this nation. There are thousands of people that know something's coming. Amen. So we got to do it. So would you stand your feet for just a minute? And I'm going to ask you to do something not outrageous by any means. I'm going to ask you to raise your arms in there right where you are and begin to declare to the Lord what you need from Him to help you to stand in the things that are coming. Confess to Him the weaknesses, the frustrations, the difficulties, the sins. The things that are holding you back from walking completely 100% for Him. Stable your arms up, almost like you're, you're a dad asking for your father's hand to guide you and to help you. Because we're going to need that guidance. Even now, begin to declare those things. Begin to ask the Lord to move in your life and to help you. Father God, you know what we're about to face in this country. I know the burden and emphasis that I feel in my heart, my spirit. Well, I know other pastors, other believers, other Christians, other intercessory groups, people in other nations are feeling this, Lord. So you're preparing the church for what's coming. So I pray you get this body of Christ in Burksville ready. For those that are watching online, get them ready. <clears throat> for churches around this nation, God, get us ready. Get us ready, get us ready, get us ready. And may the hand of God be working in us, with us and through us. But we confess to you our faults, our weaknesses, our sins. <clears throat> we declare our need for Jesus. Help us, Lord, to do everything you've called us to do. Be the kind of Christian you need us to become. And I do pray, Lord, in the, in the next several weeks as we go through more deeply <coughs> into the book of Revelation, I'm going to pray that you bring conviction as we deal and address with these specific sins in Romans. We're seeing people being turned over in, in, in their mind, unless their eyes, unless their hearts. All sorts of crazy things. We're seeing identity challenged. We're seeing hope eradicated. And the church has got to stand up and make, make, make a statement. No matter what it costs us. If that means jail, we'll go. If it means death, we'll see you sooner. But help us to, help us to live in faith. Who says the righteous will live by faith? Help us to do that. Lord, I'm asking this as a pre-prayer request for the next several weeks. Get this church ready for the things that we said and that need to be done in our midst in the house. <clears throat> I pray this in Jesus' name. You can be seated for just a minute. I meant what I just said. Uh, this is the easy prayer. This is the get us ready church prayer. This is the Lord in heaven uh, do something in us, with us, and through us to get us through the next several weeks. Because I do, I do expect to see a lot of uh, a lot of kickback on the messages over the next three weeks. And once again.